Today's scripture reading will be coming from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Once again, it's uh, Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. We are in a series called Beacon of Life. Um, For those of you who are joining us and and don't know, we are a church plant, and actually, obviously we're having services, but um, we are actually in a preparation period of what it means to become a new church and to be a new witness in in our city, and before we fully present what Revive is and what we're going to be in, in, in the fall. And so... This series is all about what does it mean to be the church and why, the ch- why, does, a, why does the city need a new, new church? And um, at least at the, at the beginning portion of this series, I really want to sit in on this verse. It's, 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 not, it's not a difficult passage and to understand, um, but what I'd like to do is sh- shed different ways that we are, will be light, different ways that we will be salty. I shared with you last week um, the reason this, the series is called Beacon of Life is because salt was the way that if you didn't have salt in the ancient world, your food would rot. It, it, it was, uh, they didn't have refrigeration back then. And so if something, this salt didn't work, literally people would die. People would die. If we are not salty, what, this, what Jesus is saying here is if we are not salty, our neighbors will die. That's what he's saying. They will, they, the, 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 the city, the, the, the important things of our culture will rot and people will die. It's so very important that the church is not just a, a religious people that practice their values to themselves, but that we are here to be salty for our neighbors and that we are to shed a light into their darkness. Now, today I want to talk about... Um, Specifically, like when we look at passages like this, this, you know, you can look at a passage, you are salt, you are light. It, very often what, what Christians tend to do is what we tend to do is we tend to put our meaning into those words. What do we think it means to be salty or what do we think it means to be light into a dark area? And, but what I want to do is take the Bible, what Jesus' own words, and help you to see what he means. And um, so we're going to look you know, I think this is, there, there's not, there is um, something very important going on here in this passage. These set of words come right after this very, very famous set of, of verses that are, that are often called the Beatitudes. Happy are you, blessed are you who are, but they're all strange. <laughs> they're, 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 not, they're not the kinds of blessings that our time look for. <laughs> blessed are you if you're poor in spirit. Uh, this is what the God's people look like. Hmm. We're poor in spirit. We talked about that last week. How will we be light? How will we be salty into this time, into this crazy place that we call Silicon Valley? We will be salty by, this is strange, by mourning. By mourning with those who mourn. That's what I want to talk about today. So in three parts, part one, life has tears. That, that, that shouldn't... I know that sounds like a strange thing to say because doesn't everybody know that? I don't think in our city everybody knows that. <laughs> I don't think in our city everybody knows that. And especially for those of you guys who are young, maybe you don't know that. Um, that's part one. Life has tears. Part two, the eternal family that mourns together. That's the church. <laughs> We're a family that cannot be broken, but we can cry and we will cry. In fact, Jesus says, Mourn and mourn together. The world needs it. And part three, the God who wipes away tears. That's why we can mourn. And we can mourn and invite other people to mourn with us and we can mourn with them because we have a God who wipes away tears. 
Um, so let's start. This uh, passage, verses 13 to 16, um, I think there are many different ways. And so the way I want to look at it is take, let's go to verse 4. So here's what Jesus says. This is a verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's what we talked about last week. But today I want to talk about this. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Some have said, um, I forget, there's a famous scholar who said this, or, or is a famous pastor, who said that the Beatitudes, they're like, the, they're like a constitution. They're a description of God's people. Um, do you notice that they're not, blessed are you who are good looking and who are billionaires, right? <laughs> blessed are you if you get a 1550 on the SAT and get to go to Stanford. It doesn't say that, right? It says those who are poor in spirit, those who mourn. And I want to just start by first talking about this. Um, you know that uh, this is, this is, Jesus takes all things in this world and the things that we think are up to Jesus are down. And the things that we think are down, he's, he thinks are up. The, you know, our, our sister Grace, she, she prayed that, um, you know, she's citing this verse out of, out of Jonah where the Lord looks at Nineveh and he says, these are people that don't know their left hand from their right. <laughs> this is a, what, what you see in the Beatitudes. When God looks at us, says, you think these things are bad, but I see something good and right. You know, because we are drunk with success in our, in our city. <laughs> that if you, are, if, you are, if you are smart and if you are talented and if you can achieve, 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 I mean, we literally have, uh, you know, the top companies of certain industries, and some of you work for them, and uh, the, the demands on you are very, very high. And then just to get into a kind of modest middle-class house, it costs insane amounts of money, but around here, everybody just accepts that as normal, because, hey, you just, you just better work harder and achieve, and then your life will be good. But that's not the way God looks at it. The Son of God, he says, you can be blessed when you cry. <laughs> you know what he's saying? If you're a normal person, <laughs> if you're a normal person, you can be blessed and I will comfort you. There will be a comfort for you. That's an incredible thing. Uh, I want to just start off by saying this. Um, our city thinks if you get X, Y, Z, then everything will be great. <laughs> If you mourn, if you cry, you must be weak. Um, you know, in our city, if you are going through something really, really bad and you're falling apart, <laughs> who do you say that to? <laughs> who do you say that to? Um, in our time, if you are depressed, you, who are you supposed to say that to? To your friends? If you, if you have a friend that will... You can't even say it to your friend. To your family? You have to go... Find a therapist, but how do you know if your therapist will be good enough? There are good ones and there aren't such good ones. But then how do you know they might, if you go to a psychiatrist, but they might give you a pill? Now, I'm not saying these things are bad because some, those pills sometimes help. But, you know, we're, we're not even sure who we can say this to. I'm mourning. I'm hurting. And, but I want to just say this to you first, first of all. This is going to happen to you. Maybe, it's, maybe you're mourning now. In a room this size, some percentage of you are mourning. But when you get up in the morning and then when you go out, you pretend you're not. Isn't that what we do? We all pretend we're not. Who puts on their Facebook posts? Today, I feel really, really crappy. And when I woke up in the morning, I didn't want to get out of bed it was really hard to just get out of bed because life has kicked me and when I get up, I don't actually get up. Who posts that? Who posts that? We post the, the you know, you get the, like, the perfect vacation shot. <laughs> you, you go find, um, you know, the food that you just ate yesterday, which was the coolest food, and then you say, I'm eating this. <laughs> this is what we post. So then, when we all look at everybody else's post, everybody is happy, right? No, <laughs> they're not. We're faking. But life is filled 
with tears. Sometimes short, sometimes long. And sometimes the morning is so long, we don't even have any more tears. <laughs> um, normally, the tears are something really tough really happens. I'll, I'll just, like, let me just name some. Um, marriage is failing. Maybe yours. Maybe your parents. Maybe your siblings. Um, when I was in college, uh, I, 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 was, I was a part of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. So the functional guy who was my pastor was my InterVarsity staff leader. And he shared that um, last, the previous year, his brother had, was divorcing his wife. And she was a Christian whom he had introduced to his brother. <laughs> so he was furious at his brother. <laughs> So he would wake up and he was crying and unbelievably hurting for his brother and for his sister in the Lord who was his friend who introduced his wife and, and furious at his brother. All of that. That's a pretty, par- that's a pretty powerful piece of mourning. Um, how about uh, just failures in our community? Our, um, we hear regularly the news of a policeman shot somebody. Then, but we're not sure. Was that just? Was that unjust? I mean, regardless, it's terrible. <laughs> um, we hear other things. You, you could be mourning because maybe your coworker or your friend betrayed you, stabbed you pretty good, but they didn't stab you with a knife. They stab you with words. They stab you with lies. Which, by the way, is worse, I think. Because at least the knife wound will, will heal. But those stabs with those words, they might not, it might not heal. At least not tomorrow. Or next year. Or five years. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a father. If one of my children is hurting, I'm hurting. <laughs> So, who was it that said this? It was a famous writer that said that you can only be as, as happy as your least happy child <laughs> after you become a parent. I was like, wow, that's terrible. <laughs> I was like, and yet so true. Um, so if one of your children, what if one of your children is afflicted with a disease? What if one of your children um, gets into an addiction? then you're mourning. And then maybe the one that, you know, somewhere along the line, some of you guys are young, so maybe you haven't tasted this. Hopefully you haven't tasted this. But just live a little while. And this is just part of the normal mourning of life. So once somebody you love will, you'll lose them because they'll die. (laughs) It's strange. I think about, I actually, maybe I'm just morbid. I actually think about this a lot. I'm not afraid to die. (laughs) I myself am not afraid to die. Of course, I don't want to die in some horrific way. But to the dying itself, I'm not afraid to die. But I am really afraid that my wife will die. <laughs> I'm really afraid of that one. That's just like right up there at the top of, my, of the fears of my life. You know? Uh, if one of my children dies, I, I would feel like life is over. Life is over. So those are, these are all... And who isn't going to be touched by one of these things in this room? 98% of you are going to be touched by one of these things. Like next week, next month, six months, or next year. Life has tears. <laughs> and isn't it so great that Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. <laughs> That's a savior. <laughs> in our city, Who says that? Nobody says that. And if you are in a city where nobody says that, nobody thinks that, nobody looks at life like that, man, they need a church. (laughs) They need a church. They need a church that will read these words and believe these words and live in these words. Absolutely. If if we stink at all the other words, but we do this one, (laughs) that's a good church. That's what I think. Churches, no church is good at everything. 
most churches are bad at X, Y, Z, where you get like a C minus and these things. But like, we're like good at like just maybe one or two things. But if your church can mourn, and remember, there's always mourners. We show up, you know, we, you know we're like, we're, we're not too different. We show up with a happy face too. But somebody at church is crying. <laughs> Somebody's hurting. And I, I've already said this. I want Revive to be the place where any given Sunday, everybody else looks like they're happy. But you could fall apart. You could be sitting right there and just start bawling and fall apart. And, and I will be really happy if everybody else goes, that's perfectly fine and normal. <laughs> because blessed are you who mourn. <laughs> Jesus said it. <laughs> Life has tears. I want to give you a little... One little quick Bible lesson. Bible, I want just to, let me give you a little, I gotta, I gotta punch in these little things every now and then when it's relevant. So this is how the Bible works. All the words that are in here, they're alive, <laughs> okay? We say words and then they die and then they become, and then sometimes they're just dumb. All these words are true and they're alive, okay? They're from God. <laughs> they're infallible and they're inspired. So you get one verse here, it doesn't look like it's much, and then you get another verse there, and then one verse sheds light on these other words, and then these words shed light on these other words. Do you realize verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, tells you how verse 13 and 16, how to be salt and light. Hmm. How, do you be, how are you supposed to be salt and light? Well, we can go back to verse 3. Oh, 4. Well, whoa, there's more mourning. That's a strange way to be light. That's a strange way to be salty in our city. This is how the Bible works. Please don't, don't ever disrespect this. And you can memorize a lot of verses. It's good to memorize a lot of verses. Then you have more of God's powerful words <laughs> shedding light into your mind. And then this is how you can be light and salty. Right? Let's go to part two. The eternal family that mourns together. So... Um, I want to just, this is maybe a really simple and basic point, but um, I think in our very, very autonomous oriented city, in our city, what is constantly being preached at you is you must be strong and it's on you. You, you, be, you, you put up, you know, put up the front and be strong and just stiff up her lip. You can get through it. You can deal with it. But maybe what God wants us is to mourn and mourn together. <laughs> I think that's the church. We have faith in Jesus, the one who said this word. <laughs> and then we have faith in his redemptive work for us. And because of that, we can mourn together. So let, let me just show you a couple of verses here. So this is Romans chapter 12. This, uh, this is great. Uh, great little grab bag, but I'll just... Um, verse 12, rejoice... Oh, verse 15. Romans chapter 12, verse 15. We got it up here? No? Yes? I guess we're, not, we're just having... Oh, there we go. Rejoice with those who rejoice. How about this? Weep with those who weep. Here, let me, let me just read out loud. Verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. They're cursing us. But let's curse, not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another and do not be haughty. Be, but associate with the lowly. Some of the people we need to associate with, you know why they're lowly? Because they're weeping. I don't have a problem in my life. I don't know why you're so sad. That's haughty. That's haughty. Because tomorrow, you'll be lowly. And you'll be weeping. And don't you feel so terribly lonely and nobody else will enter into your weeping? That's terrible. That's terrible. But that's, I think our city is intensely lonely. All your friends, some of them, they call themselves your friends, but they, they're not sure if you're their friend. Some of the people you call your friend, do you really think they're your friend? So think of all your friends. Can you cry with them? When you're really, really hurting, can you tell them and they will cry with you? That's your friend. <laughs> That's your friend. How many friends do you have? In this city, 
a lot of people, I would venture to say, have a grand total of zero. <laughs> That's really, really bad. And you want to know why some of them aren't just sad when there's divorce or sickness or something bad happens in their life. They're just sad at life. <laughs> They're disappointed with the whole thing. That's called depression. A lot of them are lonely. <laughs> they need somebody to cry with them. It's really important. It's so important. I'll give you another verse. This is our 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 26, if one member suffers, all suffer together. Let me read the whole passage. But God has so composed the body. This is the church. This is God's description of the church. God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, there it is all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. It's not that different. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. How will they be comforted? Through the church. <laughs> through the church. Through the gospel, first through Jesus, and then the people of the gospel, the church. Now, I think um, this is the way this is really one of the strange things about God. <laughs> you know, we are very angry, or some of us are very angry. You've all probably been there at one point or another. I've been there, which is, how come God doesn't use his almighty power, snap his finger, and fix this problem? <laughs> you know, you were like, why did this person have to cut me off today of all days when I'm late for work? <laughs> Couldn't he have just fixed this problem? And then, you know, you get, you're mad at this person, and you're mad at God. Why do you have to let this happen to you? I mean, those are like minor things, but like, but then what if something really bad happens? But God is very strange. He says, it's okay. It's okay to hurt. It's okay to hurt together. And then you will find out that my glory is when I cry with you. And we cry together. That's the God of the cross. That's a real God. A God that can never weep with, in, to people whose life has filled with tears, that's not a real God. <laughs> that's not a real God. This is a real God. And his glory is in the tears. Isn't that incredible? Now what I want to do in this um, second, in, in, you know, before I go to the, the, the third portion of my message, is I want to just give a couple of like, little application points. Revive, we're going to be a church. What kind of a church shall we be? It sounds strange. Yeah, I want us to have a really good band. I want us to have a great website. I want us to have a good logo. I want us to have excellence in the way we do service. Yes, yes, yes. Okay? But if we don't mourn, then we, we stink. <laughs> I think we stink. We will not shine very well. We will not be very, very salty. Maybe all the cool, happy people will think, you're cool and happy. It's like, being a click for the coolest people in the high school. Do you want to be a click for the coolest people in the high school? Jesus wants to be friends with the lowliest hurting people too. Which is the normal people. <laughs> so there's a few things I want to, I want to say. How, how we can be in this way. So number one, this may sound very strange, but simply, first believe in the risen Christ. In other words, believe in the gospel. The gospel, let me say the gospel a little differently. The gospel proclaims good news to those who cry because they failed their life. They sinned a lot of sins. And the curse of sin has gotten them. And they're going to die. They're so, hence they cry. But there's a God who will enter into their crying and then turn their tears to joy eternally. That's the gospel. Huh. First, we must believe in the gospel and its power. Huh. We don't have to believe how greatly powerful we are, but we must believe in the power of the one who quenches the tears, Jesus. Huh. Number one, believe in the power 
and that he is here. He's with us. And whenever you walk in, can you just think about this? I, I know we're like, we tend to walk in a little kind of oblivious. You know, we're, 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 we, you know, we tend to be self-centered. I'm in a good mood, so I want to be around someone who's in a good mood. I'm not in a good mood, so don't bother me, <laughs> right? When we walk into church or when we just hang out with one another. But maybe when you're at work, you walk into your office. I want to just remember somebody in, in my team is mourning today. So many in my team is mourning today. And I have Jesus. <laughs> the God who could walk into their mourning. So they can be touched by Jesus because I'm here with Jesus. And we will be salting the city. So number one, believe in the gospel. Number two, be a good, good listener. Listening is so important. So I ask them a question, how are you doing? Actually want to know. <laughs> and then when they give you the answer, first of all, they won't believe that you actually want to know. But if you actually practice listening, and don't just listen like here, blah, 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 what they're saying. Like, try to pay attention to what's on their face. Does their face look like it's in pain? Does their face look like they are afraid? Listen. So this is what's so important about listening. So some people say, it's just talking, right? <laughs> They're talking. What's so important about that? Oh my goodness. It's so important. Because out of the overflow of the, of the heart, the mouth speaks. <laughs> what comes out of their mouth is in their heart. And if pain and mourning and tears are in their heart, it will, it will begin to be manifested out of their mouth. So when you are hurting, so maybe the, some of you guys, maybe you don't know this. Okay? When you're hurting, this is what you should do. You should tell somebody you're hurting. It's better than getting drunk. It's better than like two hours of mindless entertainment. Because this is the really weird thing that will happen. Go to somebody who will actually listen to you. And then when you let your hurt your mourning come out they will hear it and then they bear it this is strange they bear it they will bear some of your sadness and then some of your sadness becomes less <laughs> this is the way god made it so i know our city is all about can do do this do this achieve this do this listen that's 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 that, i would say you know what if you can achieve listening. It's so important. If you can be a listening soul to someone who's mourning, you will, their, their crying will come out. You will bear that hurt. Their hurt will become less. You have loved them. And their life just got a little better, maybe a lot better. Maybe a lot better. Of course the church has to be this. In the church, in the building, in when we gather, and when we're being the church out in the city. <laughs> Absolutely. So number one, believe in the power of the God who wipes away tears. Number two, become a good listener. Number three, it said so in the 1 Corinthians 12 passage. It takes Loneliness. If you're up here and everything's great with you, how can you be helpful to someone who's down there because they're crying? You have to come down. You have to come down. And it's not that hard. You just have to remember the time in your life when you were desperate, when you were falling apart, when you were crying. Try to remember that time. If you've never had a time in your life like that, then we all hate you. Sorry. <laughs> but no, you, that's probably impossible. You all had that time. If you could just remember, you're frail. And if you could remember, tomorrow, you will mourn. So be open. Be lowly. It's okay to be frail. It's strange, though. As you go into this place, it, it, it requires some skills. You need patience. 
You need perseverance. You may even need some toughness. Because sometimes when they mourn, people get angry. <laughs> they can, like, ugly things can come out of their mouth. That's part of mourning too. So sometimes you need to have a, you got to be kind of tough. Well, I've got to take this. Got to take some of the ugliness too. And uh, perseverance. I want to say something to um, millennials. So I hope this doesn't sound too mean. You know what's really, really great about millennials? You want big things in life. You're idealistic. It said, I'm, I'm X generation. We were, we, were, we, were, we were called the greedy generation. We don't care about big things. We just want to make money. I don't know if that's entirely true, but that's, that was our reputation. Your reputation is you're highly idealistic. That's, that's good. But you also need some toughness. Your reputation is you don't have very good perseverance. And you're impatient. Right? You want to make a difference in the world. It's great to make a difference in the world. Make a difference by persevering in patience. Listen, and then listen again, and then listen again. Hmm. And one more. Um, this is a little bit more of a warning, all right? It's a little bit more of a warning. At times, um, if you allow yourself to cry with somebody else. You should say, I, I'm, I'm going to actually allow sadness to come into my life and I will be sad because I will find out that you are abused by your mother and every day is dark for you. Oh my goodness. And if I allow that feeling to come into me, some of that darkness and pain will come into me. That's what's going to happen. But we need to do that. Some other people need us to do that. That's being the church. But sometimes it'll become maybe overwhelming. <laughs> it'll become too much. And in here, here's a little piece of advice. Now you need to turn to your brother and sister and let somebody else be the church with you and say, it's too much. And then we go back to point number one, believe the gospel. <laughs> Jesus is the one. You can say, Jesus, I don't... I'm hurting and mourning with my brother. But I don't know if I can handle this. And I'm afraid to let him down. I'm afraid to let her down. But we will. Jesus, would you be strong or I'm weak? And we go back to the gospel. So, not if, when. When... Your love and compassion and mercy, and I will cry with you, and you all cried out, and like, I'm, I've got no more mercy and compassion left, and I don't want to cry anymore. When you get to that place, not if you get to that place. I'm a pastor. You, I, I, I've been to that place many times, because as a pastor, I'm supposed to mourn with people. I have been mourned out. <laughs> I've been mourned out. I'm like, okay, this is a tough problem. We need to outsource this to a therapist. <laughs> It's like, do we have good therapists in the city? I need to find all their names. And then, well, I'll raise money because I'm mourned out. Well, I don't feel entirely guilty about that, but you know what? Because they need Jesus more than they need me. <laughs> but then I need Jesus to go back into that well of mourning with them. It's okay to, be, to get to the end of your rope because you won't have much. When you start to mourn with people, you'll find that your love is pretty small, <laughs> even in your a pastor. All right. So some of you are like, oh, pastor, he really loves us a lot. Surprise, I love you kind of a kind of little bit. I'm trying to love you slightly more than the average person. <laughs> but then, mostly, Jesus shows up because <laughs> I know how to do number four. <laughs> I know how to do number one, believe in the gospel, and then I forget the gospel, and then I'm all like mourned out. Oh yeah, I got to believe in the gospel again. So then sometimes you think I'm loving you, but I'm probably not loving you. I'm just trying to love you, but Jesus is loving you. Church, this is how we do it. We believe in the gospel, then we use the gospel, and then Jesus shows up, and then he wipes away tears. Let's talk about the God who wipes away tears. I want to give you uh, another verse. See, this is all over the Bible. 
Revelation 21. This is my favorite, favorite places in the Bible. It's one of my favorite, favorite verses in the Bible. So here's what it says. Verse 3. I heard a loud verse voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Won't that be great when that's true? Right now, it feels like God is not that close to us. He's not dwelling with us. But there'll be a time when he utterly dwells everybody. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. That's marriage language. That's covenant language. That's unity. (laughs) But here it is. Here it is. Verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning. There it is. Neither shall be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. This is why we can mourn, because one day it will end. This is our God. And we need to have this God in us, with us, and proclaiming him all the time, and that's being the church. Oh my goodness, this is what our neighbors need. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to close with an example of this that was very, very personal to me and my wife. And I hope this is the kind of church we can be. Um, in um, the mid-2000s, early 2000, 2000, when was it? Five? Um, Grace's mother, my mother-in-law, she was uh, um, diagnosed with stage four cancer. It was so advanced, we didn't even know what kind of cancer it was. They, doctors think it was lung cancer, but not sure. Never smoked a day in her life. <laughs> um, uh, my brother-in-law's brother-in-law, so I guess he's my brother-in-law, he's an he's a oncologist, and he, he pushed him really hard and said, how long do I got with mom? And he said, maybe six months. The Lord gave us more than two years. It was great. But those last few months when mom went into hospice, that, they, they were, that was... It was really hard. And, um, and there was a, we had a card at church. So we attended a church called New Life Presbyterian Church of Glenside. This is in greater Philadelphia. It was when I was you know, working on a PhD. Most of us being a nerd every day. But then we had this terrible affliction in, in our hearts. And um, we had shared, there was a prayer card. Grace's mom is cancer. And people in the church prayed for us regularly. And um, it was a tough time for the church. You know, at this period, two of the elders, so you guys saw a bunch of great men up here who were the elders. They're the pillars of the church. I mean, there are men who came up here of Trinity who, you know, if they weren't here 10 years ago or 20 years ago, Trinity would have been in big trouble. (laughs) Well, two of those guys at New Life Presbyterian Church, Church, they were dying of cancer. So this, in this period, when, all, when our mom had cancer, two of these guys were dying. They were pillars in the church. One of them was a professor at Westminster Seminary, Al Gross. He died of melanoma. It was terrible for the church. That was unbelievable mourning. It was also unbelievable glory. Crazy. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> there was another elder. His name was Roger Clark. And um, we had a special connection to Roger his daughter, Daisy, was in our small group, right? And um, I, I, there was one night when I was studying really hard, and Roger and his wife, Karen, you know, bumped into me at Panera and gave me a hug and said, we are so grateful that our daughter is in your small group. And I was sitting there going, like, I don't know why. I'm not that good a small group leader. <laughs> but, I'm go- but we try to love your daughter. <laughs> and, um, and at this point, Roger was dying. I'm not sure. I can't remember which. I think it, I want to. I want to say it was Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, um, Roger was a school teacher. He's an unassuming man. This is what Roger and Karen were like. They, they had a beautiful marriage. They um they were a blended family. This this was both their second marriage. I think um Roger was a widower. He had he had lost his his, his first wife. So he had had this, 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 this morning that I'm so deathly afraid of. He, he experienced that pain. 
And I think his wife, um, she, she was Caucasian, but she had married an Asian man. I think he was Thai, but like that marriage did not work out, and I think he abandoned her. And um, so she had experienced that pain. And then they, I don't know if they, had, they met, they knew Jesus during their first marriage, but then they got to know Jesus, and then they met each other. And so they had like stepsons and stepdaughters. And, but when you, when you were around the Clarks, you had no idea who's related to who who's like biologically they do because that was just a beautiful family. <laughs> That's what they were like. And Roger and Karen, they would do things that like, um, I never heard anybody, at least in the Korean church, I shouldn't, say, I, I shouldn't say never, but it was really weird. It was really eye-opening to me. They, I think, had a finished basement in their house and they deliberately redid that portion of their house so that when missionaries came into town, they had a place to stay for free. They had, a, they had a car that they deliberately kept up so that they could loan that car out to missionaries and to the people who got down on their luck in their, in, their, in their church and to their neighbors. This is what they were like. Awesome people. And, um, and so when Grace's mother passed away after, you know, like a couple months of just terrible, just watching her suffer, um, the elders, um, you know, they, one of the elders volunteered. I'm pretty sure Roger volunteered. <laughs> Says, I will go pray with Grace and Susan. And so Roger came to our apartment. And I remember seeing him, I'm looking at him. He's, he sat at our dining table and I'm thinking, you're dying of cancer. <laughs> you're dying of cancer. But you are here to listen to our mourning, to listen to our good words that we, where we honor our mom. And then you are here to give us Jesus, to be Jesus for us. Let me tell you, he, wasn't, he was at our house for about maybe an hour. That one hour was so important. <laughs> that one hour was huge. And, um, and when Roger, I heard the news that in, you know, he, I, I so wanted to go to his funeral. He, he, he passed away a few months after we moved out to um, Silicon Valley. And I, I, I wept that day hearing the news that Roger went home to Jesus. May revived church be filled with Roger Clarks. <laughs> hmm. Because Roger had the Jesus who wipes away tears in his heart. And though death was knocking on his door, he could cry with those who cried. And life, (laughs) it's like like life was beating death. So there are dying, mourning people all around us. Would you be Roger Clark to them (laughs) and show them Jesus? No more tears. Let's pray.